Hey, all you music making friends out there, Jack here. And today I've got another artist interview for you. Her name is Shannon Curtis. She's a longtime independent musician, successful. She's been doing it for many years full time. We talk about a song that went viral years back and how that came about. We talk about successful house concert tours that she's done. She was so successful with house concert tours that she wrote a book about it. It's called No Booker, No Bouncer, No Bartender. And she talks about how she made 25K in two months. So if you've ever thought about doing house concerts, definitely give that a listen. There's a lot, lots of really good nuggets in there. She also just gives back to her fans a lot. She's really created a tribe around her music. And that's something that we can all kind of think about. How do we build a tribe around our music? And again, gives back to her fans. She has a newsletter that you can sign up for at shannoncurtis.net. It's called Shannon's Love Letters. And she has some really great new releases. Uh, she has an album of 80s covers, which is super rad. She has... Uh, another album um, called Good To Me. It's a really cool synth pop album. So go check that out. And um, it's just was such a great conversation. Really fun to talk to her. And so I will stop there so you can enjoy my interview with Shannon Curtis. You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY. DIY. Oh. Musician. <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> Hey, Shannon. How's How are you? Oh, it's gone so good. I'm so glad to have you here. I'm in the headphones, so he can't hear you, but Jamie's right here. Oh my gosh. What's up, Jamie? What's up, Jamie? Hi, Jack. <laughs> so good to see you both. Good to see you too. Thank you so much for joining me. I've been really looking forward to this chat. Thank you for inviting me. It's very cool that you did that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's a pleasure to work with your husband. Um on music and um i've been following your journey a lot and i thought what uh, there couldn't be a better guest than shannon curtis so Aww. i'm so excited and um the the whole kind of purpose of this series of interviews that i'm doing is to un uncover spark moments for musicians mm -hmm. that being like any turning points that you saw in your career where you started getting traction and i know and i'm learning along the way that it's a lot of times it's not just one you know there's a lot of them it's like milestones um, in your career. And so um, I definitely want to make sure that we get to those. But uh -huh. I think maybe a good place to start is giving all of our listeners just sort of a synopsis of who you are and what you're up to right now. That sounds great. Sure. Uh, who am I? That's a deep question, Jack. How, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Shannon. Um, I make music, uh, songwriter, performer, uh, recording artist. Um, these days I'm writing songs in sort of the synth pop, electro pop, 80s, in, 80s inspired, but still very modern sort of sound of things. Um, and I work with my husband and co-conspirator, uh, Jamie Hill. Um, we are partners in crime in all the things we do. Uh, and that's just a really just over big overview. What I'm doing right now is preparing to go back out on a, on the first tour that we've done since the pandemic. Um, wow. and it's a, it's a small one and we're experimenting with some new things and sort of entering a new space. We, I'm sure we can talk about that in more detail later, but, um, that is what's consuming my world right now. Um, uh, it feels like cliff diving and I'll tell you more about that later too. <laughs> cool. Yeah. It sounds like you, you're all pretty busy right now, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are working musicians, working artists. It just means that we're always busy. Like, you know, we work for ourselves. This is, we, we pay all of our bills via art we've made, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? So like it's, it's, we're, you know, we're self-employed in the best possible way, but you know, what that means is that every day is a potential work day and every day like, there's always stuff to be done. There's no clocking out. I mean, we do clock out. We've learned that we have to do that, but like, mm -hmm. yeah, we're always busy. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Well, that's, I feel like that's such an aspiration for a lot of us is to get to that point of full-time musician, artist, creator, where we don't have to have a day job, you know, that is your day job. And that's, 
partly why I wanted to talk to you because that's also one of my aspirations. Yeah. Um, yeah. We also have a new album, uh, Good to Me, which um, is amazing, by the way. One of my favorite new albums that I've been listening to. Wow. My thank wife's you. too. Yeah, it's so good. Um, sonically, songwriting wise, um, I encourage everyone to go check that album out. And then on top of that, you also have released some 80s kids songs, yeah. um, which are amazing. And I was telling Jamie at one point that, and not to compare, but it reminded me of that Weezer cover of uh, a Toto song where they recreated the instruments so perfectly and that it just was an incredible cover. But what I was telling him is that I like yours even more because then on top of that, because Jamie did an amazing, crazy job on the, the instru instrumentation and the sound. I mean, it sounds incredible. Yeah. But then you have a more of a, like a unique voice on top of that because it was, you know, a lot of these are male singers that you're covering, but you have a, a you know, you're a female singer and it just, it, it's just that much better to me. And it's just so good. I'm so glad you're enjoying it. I feel like me being a, a female vocalist singing these songs that were originally recorded by male singers, it just it sh it just kind of shades in a different meaning or something. You know what I mean? Like I just, mm -hmm. I, it just it, 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 you can't help but listen from a slightly different perspective. Right. And I love that about it. It's been really right. fun. Yeah, that's that's definitely something that I noticed, and it's it really caught me and. Added that one to one of my playlists because it's so good. Um, well, because you have multiple of those songs. Um, Take On Me. What are some of the other ones that we you We started with um, a, a version of Wouldn't It Be Good, which was on the Pretty in Pink soundtrack. Um, that was our, the first one we did back in the spring. Um, uh, we, we recorded, so that song was originally a Nick Kershaw song, which when I heard the Nick Kershaw, Kershaw recording, I'm like, this is slow and boring. Doesn't he realize he has a great song on his hands? <laughs> and the Danny Hutton hitters version of it was, was, was made for the pretty in pink soundtrack. And they kicked, they kicked its butt. They, they did a great recording of that song. And so that's the, that's the one that we modeled our cover after the second song we did was drive by the cars, um, which was just oh, <laughs> so fun to do. Um, then we did Take On Me. Uh, last month, we released The Boys of Summer so uh, by Don Henley. And then our next 80s kids song is coming out this Friday. So I, I can't tell you. By the time this is out in the world, I imagine it will be out in the world too. But for now. <laughs> yeah. You, and wow. So you are definitely busy. Um, and <laughs> obviously, you're prolific in your production and releasing music. Do you have like a daily routine when you're? when you're on um, that, or is it just kind of, you're always creating? Uh, you know, uh, that's a great question. Daily routine tends to look like first part of the day is emails, correspondence, you know, getting that kind of stuff done. Both of us tend to work on music at night. And so that's, the world just kind of calms down. There's not as many emails coming in text message you know you can kind of just like cre create the space that you need for creative stuff at that time so if there's going to be like a rhythm to things it's going to be you know busy work in the in the afternoon and then we work late into the night doing you know creative stuff and I I I do when I'm in writing mode when I'm in creating mode it's very much a discipline. Like I, I put it on my schedule for the week. Like this is when I'm going upstairs to my studio to, you know, to do my stuff. Um, and that works really well. Like, I mean, I, I, I treat it like a job cause it is, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, so why don't we, why don't we go back and just kind of talk about your journey a bit? Um, cause there's so many things that I want to talk about. Um, so we'll kind of maybe get to each one of those along your journey. So where did you start getting into music? Um, did you, were you always this style or did you kind of change styles and where did it all start? It's been all over the map, honestly. Um, I, not all over the map. I have been on a journey of just discovering what is bringing me joy. You know, I think over the course of my musical life and it's taken me in different directions, which is great. I'm, I'm glad to have had lots of different experiences. Um, uh, I started taking piano lessons when I was four. So I was, I, I did music, you know, all as a kid, uh, grew up in, um, in a church environment. So there was lots of opportunities for singing and performing because 
that just happens in those environments. Oh yeah. Um, so music was a big part of my life throughout my whole, you know, uh, childhood, teenage years. I went to college uh, thinking I was going to eventually apply to medical school. And I had this moment my senior year of college where I was like, no, actually, I want to do music. And it was terrifying because I didn't, uh, I didn't know how one did that. So I didn't apply to medical school. I moved back to my hometown in uh, Central Valley of California. And I started substitute teaching and eventually found uh, a, a, a guy who was wanting to start a band. And so we started a band together. And it was such a great, um, it was like a, a guitar. I'm a piano player or keyboard player, but this was a guitar based alternative rock band. And um, I, I was one of the pr principal songwriters and my friend Steve was the other one. And it was such a great just learning experience. I, that is where I learned about songwriting, about recording, about booking shows, about what it feels like to be on a proper stage and, you know, performing and, we, we did touring. We did a bunch of college touring. Um, that band did play to like college campuses all over the United States. And so I, I just learned so much in the, what, like seven or eight years that I was in that band. Um, that band sort of came to an end. Guys were moving on and getting married and having kids. My life was in a big transition. And I, 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 we, 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 we ended as a band and I started a solo career. And it was just me behind a piano very different than from the guitar based alt rock thing that I had been doing. But I started playing my little heartbroken love songs behind my piano. <laughs> <laughs> and I started doing that in 2006, middle of 2006. Um, and I continued doing some of the college touring. Um, I used the college shows as kind of like a, a way to sort of tour support playing in other venues all around the country. So I was able to like, pay my bills with the, the college money, <laughs> you know, right. the college gigs. And then I would book, you know, in between those at small venues, coffee shops, you name it. Just, and I would, I, I just drove laps around the country by myself in my little Volkswagen Jetta and my piano. Classic. And yeah, that's what I did for <laughs> a number of years. Um, and then, um, and then in 2011, I was living in Los Angeles at the time, by the way, I lived there for about a decade. And, uh, I, about 2011, a woman in San Diego who had seen me perform sent me a message. She's like, you should come and play in San Diego. You haven't been here in a while. You could play in my living room. I'll invite my friends and we'll make, we'll take donations for the show. What do you think? And I'm like, that sounds a little nuts, but why not? Like, what can we, what do we have to lose? We'll probably at least make our gas money. Let's go. And that was a light bulb moment for me that sort of like, uh, uh, set me off, set us off on a whole journey that ended up being the last 10 years, Jamie and I did about 600 house concerts all over the country. Wow. Um, and we wrote a, a, an Amazon bestseller book about it, teaching other mm -hmm. artists how to do it. Um, it was a completely transformative experience um, diving into that, that house concert world and, and figuring out how to build a community around the music that, we're, that we make um, in this very under the radar grassroots kind of way. It was just some of the most fulfilling, fun, wonderful times. Um, but it was all still me behind a piano, you know, doing, yeah. doing that kind of yeah. stuff. And we, we pushed the limits of what we could do in those environments to try to bring sort of like this wow experience to people's backyards. You know, like we, we did bring in some like soundscape stuff and like some, some score behind storytelling just to kind of like amp up the drama a little bit and give people like a, what is happening in my friend's backyard experience, you know? Right. Right. And, and that was really fun. We really pushed, I think all the limits of, of creative limits of, of that sort of, uh, of a way of, to, of sharing music pandemic hit. Obviously everything stopped and we had an opportunity to reevaluate, reimagine. Like it was just a time when I think, for a lot of folks, we all kind of like went inward because we were forced to in a lot of ways and evaluated like, okay, what's been good? What do I want to keep around? What do I want to let go of? What do I want to do going forward? And for me on a couple of fronts, a lot of things ch were changed during that sort of inward time. One of which was sort of a new sound in terms of the music. I had time we had been, I should say, on in those 10 years of house concert touring, um, I wrote and we recorded and released a full length studio record once a year for 10 years in a row. So like we were on a very fast clip. 
because we were going out each year on a tour. We wanted new stories to tell, new t-shirts to sell. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. we wanted, we wanted to keep it fresh, you know? Sure. So when the pandemic hit and that wheel stopped, I suddenly had time to actually consider a little bit more the songs I was writing, the sounds I was using to produce the music. Like, and I, I, I taught myself a bunch uh, about synthesizers and drum programming that I had never really explored before and found myself getting into this style of, of this like sort of synth pop, electro pop, you know, that, that is again, sort of a new evolution uh, in the music that I'm creating to you, but I'm loving it. And it's, it's currently what's bringing me lots of joy. So yeah, glad no, to be there. I'm loving it too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd love to dig in a little bit more on the house concert sure. stuff. Um, because I know that's, that's a good topic for a lot of our uh, independent musicians. Um, it's kind of a, a different sort of touring that some people don't think about. Um, and so I was curious. So that first concert was like your friend, right? And she said, come on over. And she, she invited people or did you have to kind of make sure you, or she just kind of had it set up and you said, okay, let's go. She invited people. And actually, you know, we're friends now, but I, I had met her, I think once before she invited us to her house. Okay. She had seen me perform uh, at a club somewhere. And so, you know, it was just somebody who liked what I did and wanted to share that with her friends. So she invited all the people. Um, and it really hurt like that, like just not accidental, but you know what I mean? That, that, that sort of a serendipitous show in, in her little place in San Diego became um, the model for us that we, that we learned from and built upon over the ensuing 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way that we moved forward with house concerts was we weren't, so I should say there's a, as, as you know, I'm sure there's a well-established network of house concert venues all over the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is not what we did. Like we didn't play those shows. What we did is kind of like what we did at, at Amy's house in San Diego is we, we, uh, reached out to folks who support what we do, who liked the music that I was making, you know, and said, Hey, what if you became a house concert host? And then we helped them plan a show where they invited their community of people. So we were kind of creating our own little markets in each place. Cause I think those, the house concert venues are wonderful, like so fun, so great, great vibes, but they present a lot of the same issues that just regular venue touring can present for artists. There's mm -hmm. scarcity in terms of the number of slots that people are booking, you're tapping into a, like a, a, an audience that's getting tapped into a lot for these shows, you know? And so what we discovered in the model that we ended up um, sort of developing over the years is that what, what we could do is leverage the power of our community to grow our community in ways where we are we're creating these unique little markets. So like it, it meant that in some places we would play, we would stay in a town and play five shows within like a, two mile radius, <laughs> you know, wow. you would never do that on sure. a regular tour, but like each of these shows were unique people. Cause every, every host had a unique group of friends, a new, you know, that, that right. it was like, it was, it was not, we weren't like, um, we weren't, uh, stealing audience from other, you know, the other shows, it was sure. each a unique place. So it, it just, it was really, it was really awesome. It, it, it was, um, super eye-opening in terms of, of, of someone who, you know, at the time had been living in Los Angeles and being, had been like exposed to like what the, the scene was like in LA as a singer songwriter, you know, and like kind of network for the right connections and play at the right venues and da, 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 And like, it, it all makes me want to vomit in my mouth, like all of that <laughs> world. It really does. But what we were learning in these house concert tours is that, Oh my God, you can actually build a meaning, meaningful connections with people and really build what feels like community right. around was... shared art experiences that's so powerful and so deep and so much deeper than the shallow connections that you make while you're networking in LA. <laughs> right. Or, or on social media, typically, right? Yeah. I mean, I imagine you built such a tribe doing that. Like every house concert, I'm sure, was just so much more intimate and emotional for every audience member. Oh yeah, over the years, because we would go back a lot each summer to our, our tour, our house concert tours were always in the summertime just because it was easier to travel and we did a lot of shows outdoors, you know, and people have free time and it was a good time to do that. 
so we'd go back to the same houses a lot each year. Like there was a house, mm. a family in Boise um, who hosted a show on every single one of our house concert tours. You know, like they, they were like, I just love you. I think that they had, <laughs> they had the best record of all, you know, they, they got yeah. in early and yeah. then we were there every summer, but going to their house each year felt like a little family reunion. You know, like we felt like we were hanging out with a bunch of cousins for a day. Mm -hmm. It was so mm -hmm. wonderful. So human. It was so great. And that totally reminds me of like the um, thousand super fans. Have you heard about that oh, yeah. sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get a thousand super fans and that'll pay for uh, your, your yearly salary, right? And I imagine like those are super fans, right? Yeah. I mean, so many of them are. Of course, every show had like the, the, the true blues and then you go out, you know, sure. with the circles and people are less, less attached or whatever. But we really saw the power of those connections, though, um, uh, when the pandemic hit, because our but prior to the pandemic, about 75 percent of our annual income was derived from our summer house concert touring. So when we couldn't do that anymore, we were like, oh, crap, yeah. <laughs> you know, what yeah. now? Um, and we had we had dabbled a teensy little bit in the idea of like patronage support, you know, Prior mm -hmm. to that, mm -hmm. we had never really done much. We'd done, we had done annual album fundraisers, which were very successful, and people always supported those um, to help us raise the capital to make the album and the merch and stuff that we would take on tour. Um, but we'd never done really a concerted patronage thing. But when the pandemic hit, we're like, well, maybe this is the time when we can ask our community to show up for us in a different way since we can't tour. And boy, did they like that having invested in that community over those years uh, really set us up in a position where we had a lot of people all over the country, um, the world too, like some international folks too, who were like, yeah, we want to see you guys continue to create during this time. And we want you to continue living indoors and eating food. So yes, I will be part of this, you know, group of people who gives a small monthly contribution to keeping y'all afloat. And that has been um, a, a massive support over these last number of years and continues to be. Now, are but, you using Patreon or, or are you doing it yourself? We did initially. Um, and so, and some of our, so some of our, our supporters are still supporting us via Patreon because that's how they first got in. But after a little while, we, um, we decided to start up our own subscription, kind of rolled our own on the subscription service. So it's just, it's like a WordPress plugin um, for uh, a website. And yeah, yeah. so we, yeah. You don't have and to give away, you don't have to give away as much of the, the money, oh, right? Yeah, there's no, there's the only percentage that would be taken out would be like credit card fees instead sure. of like there being somebody who's taking a percentage of the profit, you know, which now, is, is that a, is that a good percentage of your income now or? It's a decent percent. Yeah. Like nice. I want to say it, it covers close to half of our like monthly budget at this point. Wow. So we still have Incredible. to do other stuff to, you know, to earn the rest of our living, but our, our community is still um, supporting us. And it's part of what's making this current transition that we're making into sort of new endeavors possible because we have that stable base of support. Mm -hmm. um, we're not having to like hurry up and get out on the road as fast as we can and make as much money as possible because we've got this support that's kind of helping to sustain us while we reach for something new. Yeah. Recurring income is very uh, reliable and Nice. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> now, I wanted to ask you another question about um, kind of early in the, the house concerts. Um, you said you reached out to some of your other, um, clearly like some of your fans. Um, how did you do that? Where, how did you first identify who to reach out to? And how did you, did you have their emails or did you do a mass social post or what were you doing to reach out to those people? Yeah. So you know, it's always been a priority for me to collect email addresses for my newsletter list. Um, and uh, so when I was doing those college tours as a solo artist um, and booking, you know, clubs and coffee houses and whatever, you know, in between, I was very diligent about asking people to let me stay in touch with them via my email list. Um, and so that was in terms of like Nash, like a national, you know, net of support. That's, that's largely where it came from. I was connected to people on social media and I did use that to sort of advertise and amplify the message, but like social media changes all the time. It's unreliable, you know, like, and so the, still the most valuable asset I have is the direct connection I have with people via my email list. And so 
that is still the most important way for me to stay in touch with them. So I didn't actually, uh, there were a couple of people I want to say that I reached out to specifically about hosting house concerts initially. Um, but mostly I just, I started to, sort of telling the story via my newsletter list. Um, I call it my love letter list. And so, you know, I just kind of, I, I described the, the experience we had in San Diego. I'm like, so here's what just happened last week or last month. I remember what it was. We did this show. Here's what it felt like. Here was the, here was the experience. It was so incredible. I want to do more of this. Who would like to go on this little journey with me and host one of these shows? If we can put together enough people to do this in, you know, in your region, wherever you are in the country, we'll do a tour and we'll come to your house and do this. But we, we need your participation and, and partnership in order to do it. You know, so it was really just via mostly via my newsletter list that I recruited hosts did you just have like a piece of paper up there on the stage or on your merch table to collect emails or how are you collecting emails? Initially it was like a clipboard at the merch table, you know, and then you mm -hmm. had to like decipher people's terrible handwriting and put it in the computer <laughs> later, which is awful. Eventually um, I started using MailChimp as my, um, my email provider and they for a while had a really great uh, app that you could um, people could tap into an iPad and it would just suck it right into MailChimp. They've stopped supporting that, but I think we'll have to figure out a different way to slurp in the email. Because doing it digitally is great. These days, a QR code is a great would be a great way to do it too. Just have people like you know, uh, yeah. pull up a, a web page on a QR code. So we'll probably experiment with reinventing how we do that on this coming sure, tour. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And so that that home concert tour led to a book that you wrote: um, "No Booker, No Bouncer, No Bartender: How I Made Twenty Five K on a Two Month House Concert Tour, and How You Can Too." So you made 25K in two months. <laughs> yeah, that was um, the title comes from the uh, that the data in that title, I should say, comes from the tour that we did in 2013 because the book came out in 2014, I believe. Is that correct? I think so. Um, so we had been, been doing this house concert touring thing only for a couple of years when we first read, wrote that book. Um, if I were to update the data in that title, uh, for like our best year of the house concert tour, it'd be a lot more. Like we, we kept innovating and figuring out how to make these things, um, you know, really, you know, profitable experiences for us and enjoyable for the audience too. Um, so, wow. so yeah, that it, it grew from there. Um, and sorry about the very long book title, but yeah. No, no. <laughs> well, if you saw, I was looking to the right cause I was reading it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, yeah. So what, what made you want to like actually write the book and help others to do that? It, it grew out of, um, the fact that we were going on these tours, these house concert tours and posting on socials about them and, you know, writing about it. And I started to get a ton of, um, messages from other artists. Like, how are you doing this? Well, how did you do this? And so I was writing these really long emails to a bunch of people and, um, and eventually a friend of ours who works sort of in the music tech space, uh, she's like, you should write a book. And I'm like, oh, well, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> so essentially I just, you know, used a lot of, started with what I had been sharing with other artists about how we did it. And then just kind of went through my whole process. Like, here's everything we have learned about how to do this successfully. I want you to have this information. Like, like so many other there's, it feels like there's so many opportunities, so many corners of the independent music world where collaboration and sharing is not like encouraged. There's lots more competition and keeping things for oneself, you know. The beauty mm -hmm. of this house concert model is that there there's there's enough to go around. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean everybody mm -hmm. can, anybody can create community around their music. Um, there are over 300 million people in the United States alone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm not, somebody else isn't going to be eating my lunch if I share with them how I did this, you know? Sure. And um, it's, it's been a really wonderful uh, experience to just be able to sh just share freely and encourage that kind of spirit in this community yeah. of artists. Was it difficult to write a book? Um. No, not really. Um, especially since I had just lived it, you know, like it was just writing mm -hmm. my experience. So 
Um, and also Jamie edited the book after I wrote it and he was an English major at Tufts. So like, I think I had a, like a, a ringer in my back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it helps. That helps. Yeah. <laughs> now you also did a TEDx talk, which was amazing. And you started out singing, which I feel would be very nerve wracking to me to go on stage and do a, like an acapella. I'm just saying that just as I'm thinking about like, wow, I'd be nervous doing that. But it was an incredible talk. Did that come before or after the book? And what led to the TEDx talk? It came after the book. Um, that was in 2015. Um, so they're all, it's all tied together, though, because my experience doing the house concerts, and I think, I, I mean, I, I know I talked about this in the TEDx talk, that like my experience of doing house concerts opened my eyes to the power of music to forge connections with people in new ways, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, because when you're performing in somebody's living room or backyard and you sing a cappella into the space or you share the story of something that happened to you that caused you to write this song that you're going to share with people and you open yourself up in your performance in that intimate of an environment, uh, people want to reciprocate, you know, people want to be like, okay, I've seen you now. Will you see a little of me? too like and that's powerful that's like seriously like powerful connection when when we share our stories with each other you know um so the house concert experience really um really opened my eyes to a lot of that and i wrote an album in 2015 called connections um and the the first the first single from that album the single that we released prior to the records release is a song called i know i know which is basically just like come sit right here, tell me everything, you know, like we're going to, we're going to see each other in, in our hardest stories. Like we're going to, we're going to go there with each other. Um, and that's how we're going to feel like we can like survive this life and maybe even thrive in it. <laughs> you know, that's how we're going to do it. And so when we were getting ready to put the single out, I reached out into my community and I'm like, Hey, I want to make a video for the song. And I just was thinking, here's, you know, here's the theme of the song. Here's what the song's about. And I was just thinking that maybe, if you wanted to, to, you could film yourself, like write down on a, on a piece of paper, some challenge you've experienced, something you've overcome, something maybe you're still in the middle of, but it's just something, something that you have dealt with or are dealing with in your life that you want to share with people and just hold it up to the camera for a few seconds. And that's it. And I took all of the submissions and stitched those together for a video um, for the song. I know, I know. And people, whew, they dug deep in sharing for that song, for that video. They shared about their experiences with addiction, with suicide, with um, mental health stuff, with um, uh, divorce, with you know, all, all, a whole range of things, right? Um, they, really, they really showed up and that video connected and it was, uh, it was sort of a viral hit on Facebook um, when we released it. Um, which was wild because I was getting messages from people from all over the world who saw the video and were like, and now can I tell you my story? And so like for two weeks, I literally sat on my couch and all I did for two weeks was respond to people's wow. messages because of that video. The video is what led to the TEDx talk. Somebody in uh, Arlington, Virginia, who was putting together a, a TEDx conference with the theme of connection, <laughs> saw it and reached out and said, hey, would you come and do a talk about where this video came from um, and what your experience has been. So that's, that's how the TEDx talk came to me. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you didn't expect that sort of reaction. Oh, of course not. I mean, how can you? Yeah. Right. right. I mean, like right. we always make stuff, put it out in the world with the best of intentions, but you can never know what the result is going to be. You, we always have to let go of the result yeah, when you put something right. into the world, it's, you know, it's not yours anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Well, that sounds like some pretty heavy messages coming to you that you were having to field. I mean, how did that feel? Did you feel some sort of weight on you or uh, um, obligation to help these people or just respond or, or what was your feeling during that time? It was heavy. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot about, um, I think, uh, how much, of that I can personally bear, you know? Um, and so it helped me sort of going forward sort of define 
what my, what some healthy boundaries around receiving all that stuff is for me personally, you know, um, like to, to listen compassionately and to listen with empathy and not take on the weight of, you know what I mean? Like there's, Mm -hmm. there's, I, I, I've had to practice that quite a lot, you know, and that, that experience gave me a lot of opportunity to sort of evaluate how I wanted to interact, you know, um, because I always want to be open to people sharing, obviously, you know, but I, a, a person can't, uh, especially somebody who uh, has a tendency to, um, to, toward that sort of empathetic, you know, you, you, you have to, you have to sustain your, your own person <laughs> in the midst yeah. of that, you know, yeah, and yeah. I have, I For have sure. a history of, I, I, I have uh, 18 plus years in um, 12 step recovery from codependency, which is, <laughs> this is all tied into that too, right? Like it was an opportunity for me to really like examine um, how I can in a healthy way for me approach, you know, um, listening with compassion to folks who, who want and need to share and not uh, dissolving myself into each of their uh, lives and yeah. issues, you know? Yeah. Well, well, it's, yeah, it seems like a lot of the different things that you've done, the sort of this underlying uh, thing that has been is connections and these sort of the vulnerability that you've, exp- you know, you've given to people mm. and they're giving it back. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be a lot, a lot like a much deeper connection to fans, which, Again, like the thing that we need to do a lot of times is build a tribe of people that really, really are super fans. And um, so it sounds like, you know, that's that's probably decent advice for for other musicians is get real, get vulnerable, open up. One hundred percent. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think that for a lot of my career making music and like especially I think back into my 20s when I was in a band in the band, you know. I spent a lot of time thinking about how am I supposed to look and how am I supposed to present myself and how am I like just, and it's, I spent so much time trying to figure out how I was supposed to fit into this box of what I thought would be popular or that I thought would sell or that I thought would attract attention. And a, I was never really good at (laughs) that. (laughs) Um, and B, all, all of that effort in trying to be what I thought people wanted from me just creates a wall, a barrier between me and other human beings. And at the heart of what we do as musicians is we're, we are, we're, we're expressing life. We're reaching for life. We're reaching for the human experience. And that wall of trying to be something and uh, uh, that wall of inauthenticity defeats the whole purpose, (laughs) you know, like there's just, there's that it, it is. Once I decided to be done with that, (laughs) with the, the posing, you know, first of all, uh, I, I began making more meaningful connections. And that's when I started doing, like even doing house concerts at, 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 at first, I'm like, this isn't what a real artist would do. You know, like those, that was the voice in my head mm-hmm. telling me this is not what a real artist would do. I had to get over that. And I did get over that. And like, how wild is it? That's the thing that helped me build the most meaningful community around my music than ever before. If I had listened to the voice of this is not what a real artist would do, or this is, you know, like I wouldn't have what I have today in terms of the supportive community that I have, you know? And so, right. so a, the being authentic works. So if you're looking for what works, you know, just be yourself. <laughs> also, it's so much easier just to be yourself. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's just so much nicer and more free, mm-hmm. you know? And part yeah. of that maybe comes with age too. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I'm not a young person <laughs> anymore, you know, uh, I, but I, um, you know, it's just, it's just so much easier to just be yourself. Do you remember that? Are you able to like pinpoint that moment where you kind of broke down that wall of, of, um, inauthenticity? I, I think it was a, a rolling series of experiences. Yeah. And I think I it really happened 
specifically in that time of, um, of when we were figuring out how to do the house concert thing. I, that was honestly maybe the, maybe the biggest, the biggest moment, like when I had to get over that idea of like a real artist wouldn't do this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's so silly when I think about it, but like, <laughs> I, you know, that was a big hang up. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, that was probably one of the biggest shifts during that time. Wow. Yeah, that's great. You know, it's funny when we were, well, I was watching the TEDx talk with my wife Mm -hmm. and um she she was like i don't remember exactly what we were saying but she looked at me and she's like see it's all about connection and like right when she said connections you said connections <laughs> on the talk and she was like oh. and, she, and she was just like i love shannon oh my gosh i can't believe it we're like we're like soul sisters or something something she happened and I right there. <laughs> have messaged on instagram and i'm like i love you too <laughs> Can't wait to meet her in real life. <laughs> I know. I know. I wish we could come out to one of those cons. We're in California. Yeah. But uh, when your your theater concerts sound um, so amazing, we'll get to that in okay. a little bit. I was also curious about um, sync placements. Um, I, I read that you got like a Hills placement at one point. Did you get, have you gotten other uh, sync placements and have that, has that, contributed to your success much you know um there were a couple of like there was a early on there was a hill the hills placement that was back in like 2008 or 9 or something like that long time ago and still yeah the song that was in that show is a song called before the sun which was on the very first little ep i put out as a solo artist um and still to this day because of that placement it's one of the top performers on all my streaming services all the time and it's this lovely little piano song you know it sounds nothing like the music i make now so it's a little confusing sometimes you know when if if someone's like you know been a, a listener of before the sun that they listen to like good to me and they're like whoa what's going on it's part of you though you know? it is it's part of me it's part of the story i'm not i mean i love that little song yeah. so much i love it so in that regard, yeah, it's contributed to the momentum of things, I imagine. We had a song called Boomerings and Seesaws in the show Pretty Little Liars a few years after that as well. And so that's been, been really popular over the years of streaming. Um, those were the biggest sync hits. And they were, like I said, pretty early on in my solo career. Those happened quite a long time ago. And that's not to say that we haven't tried to pursue that kind of thing. We've not put lots of energy towards sync placement. Um, and so it's not been a huge part of my story. Um, there is mm -hmm. a, a music library that we work with, um, that, that places, um, our songs in the reality TV shows that, that, that they edit together <laughs> and which, you know, they're not like career builders at all, but the residual money I get from ASCAP as a result of those placements is helpful. You know, like yeah. the quarterly payments that we get on that stuff is it pays a few bills, you know what I mean? Sure. So uh, every little bit of, you know, and also like multiple different income streams is also a good way to go. Always, always, always. That has always been the name of the game. Mm -hmm, lots of, mm -hmm. we, we say it's, it's lots of sketchy little income streams <laughs> 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 added together and you got the career. The Woo! only non-sketchy one sounds like the uh, recurring revenue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Everything else you're like, I don't know if it's going to come or not. <laughs> Yep. Now, those original uh, placements, did they just come by chance or did you reach out to somebody or how did those happen? Do you remember? <laughs> you are testing my memory. <laughs> I honestly can't remember how the Hills one happened at all. Okay. So I'm not even going to try. I don't remember. Uh, the Pretty Little Liars one was from one of, there's a, a website um, uh, back in the day. It was called musicsupervisor.com that I stumbled upon. And uh, they were one of the few places that I researched back in the day that wasn't doing like shady practices for sync licensing, you know, like they weren't doing retitling. They weren't really, they weren't doing like some of the stuff that I instinctively knew just didn't feel right. God, the music industry is so full of people, right. Who are trying to figure out how to get in between an artist's hopes and dreams and their dollars. <laughs> right? like, yeah. And there were so many companies that like, were springing up around that time that just, just shady practices. And so this was one of the companies that wasn't doing anything shady. It was very straightforward. Like, look, you can upload your stuff to our, our website and it can be searchable for people who are looking for stuff. We will also play, help play stuff from time to time. 
if something gets placed, we'll split 50, 50, the, the license fee, you keep all your publishing. So like, it was, it was really, it felt okay. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? And, right. and actually they've gotten a couple other little placements for me over the years too. There was a film a couple of years ago that they put one of our songs in and, and that's fun, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, they haven't put a ton of energy into that. So um, I don't have a whole lot to offer folks who are looking to, to go that route um, in terms sure. of, it, it's, it's just such a competitive it's a, it's a competitive market, right? Like mm -hmm. labels are looking to put their up and coming artists in sync. Like that, that they, that's how they're breaking people, you know? And so like for somebody who doesn't have label representation, like it's just really, really, really hard to like get in there. So with, like with everything in this world of doing independent music, you just have to decide where you want to put your energy, you know, like you have right. to decide what you're going to spend your time on and what, you, how you think, that investment of time and energy is going to, to return to you, you know? And so like, this is just my experience. And there are lots of different ways to, to do it, obviously. But for me, what I have found to be successful is putting my energy into building community. That's been, that's been the thing, the investment that has had the, the largest return for me, uh, not just financially, but also personally, you know, like, mm -hmm. so like it, mm -hmm. it, that's where, I have, you know, I, I have shunned putting energy toward like really figuring out how to pitch sync placements. I've, I've not done that in order to spend more of my time focused on building community. Yeah. Yeah. And that's smart. I mean, cause that's sustainable too, cause sync placements can come and go, but those people are still there and, you know, and the more you engage with them, the more you release and more things that they love, they're just going to keep building, you know, and, and growing with you. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah. It's wonderful. That's that's cool. Now, um, I know I'm kind of jumping around because there's so many yeah. cool little parts in your story, but going back to that viral moment on Facebook where people were messaging you and stuff, mm. did you try to do anything else again like that because you saw that that worked? Did you did you like okay that worked? Let's do let's do it again. Yeah. In fact, um, so one of the reasons why that video went viral was because it was picked up by the the entity Upworthy. Do you know them on, they were really big yeah. on Facebook for a while, posting like positive stories, you know? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah I remember that. Yeah. And so they, so that's really kind of where that video went viral was when Upworthy reposted gotcha. it, kind okay. of like lit a fire under it. Um, and so the following year we did a similar video for a, 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 the single, the first single from the next album, um, it was a song called Who Do You Think You Are? And the song is about like, you know, when you're sitting down to like create something or you're like starting a new venture or you're thinking about, you know, trying something new. Do you have that voice in your head that says, who do you think you are to try that? You know, and it's about right. overcoming that, you know, that voice to just dive in and do the thing. Kind of like and, imposter syndrome yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we had people again, share like something that they have been wanting to challenge themselves, you know, to do. Um, and they shared that. And then they also shared sort of the other side, like what happened, you know, so someone's like, you know, I've always wanted to write a novel and I just finished my first book, you know, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So we did a similar sort of video for that and Upworthy picked that one up too. So it, it, it spread around somewhat and I still see like people's memories pop up from when they shared it back in the day on Facebook or whatever. That's really fun. Mm -hmm. Um, but it didn't get the kind of traction that the, that the, I know, I know video did. And, but then at that point, like I realized that our community really enjoyed being involved in these things. So even if it wasn't getting the kind of like viral sort of attention that that first video get, there was still value in doing it because it was an opportunity for our community to be directly involved in creating something that was amplifying the message of the music. So we've done several other videos like that over the years. Um, there was a video that we did uh, in 2017 um, for a song called Hello Dawn. Hello Dawn was the single for the album, The Space Between that we did. And that album was really just like a post 2016 election just, uh, record for me, just reaction to the, oh crap, what has just yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah. Uh, feeling and all the feelings of being fearful and the anger and the and the feeling of disconnection from so many people that are my family and neighbors and what the you know 
so that album was really about all of that. And Hello Dawn was sort of sort of an, an awakening song. And I, I'm a white lady in her 40s who needed a kick in the butt to be awake to a lot of the injustices that have existed in this society for a long, long time. But for me, uh, you know, took me a while to get on board, but that was a moment for me where I, I woke up. And so we asked people to share, you know, um, how, how they were going to get themselves how, de declarations of, of what their values were in terms of mm -hmm. like the state of the world. So I think for people in that moment, it was really a value for our community to be, for, to offer people an, an opportunity to say, this is who I am and this is what I believe. And I'm going to work for these values you know, mm -hmm. like to have give give people an opportunity to have a public outlet in that moment, I think was was a service to the community as much as it was just getting the message out. Like that was no longer about the song or like attracting new listeners. That was about allowing our community an opportunity to to be part of something that felt like it was saying what need to be said, what needed to be said out loud in that moment. You know, right, right, and in that that moment is like so with these current events is that something that you think about now like when you're creating music are you actively thinking okay something's happening in the world right now i want to write about it because it could connect to people or um or is it just more of an organic thing that just whatever is happening to you in the moment you write about i i don't think that i am motivated to write about like what's happening in the world for the sake of any like marketability strategy or whatever mm -hmm. like that's mm -hmm. not but i'm just really a genuinely like engaged person like i i read the news every day i'm like i'm a politically involved person i did a shitload of volunteering during the last couple of election cycles for the state of wisconsin i don't live there but they needed help so i like volunteered yeah, yeah. and like so like i'm i'm involved like i i, I right. that is just part of who i am naturally that's authentic me so exactly like, <laughs> yeah so it's naturally going to come out in your music exactly so yeah so that's just no gimmicks a natural outpouring so like in 20 in at the end of 2020 that seemed like it was a pretty uh significant year <laughs> <laughs> sort of yeah. a lot of ways. A at the end of that year um i collected stories from our community of of people's experience of the year mm -hmm. and did sort of like a data analysis on everybody's stories like distilled like the, the the themes that appeared most frequently in people's experience of the year 2020 and wrote an album called 2020 101 kind of like a 101 primer class on the year 2020 <laughs> and the 11 songs that are on that album are like the top 11 themes that came in people's experience of the year so it wasn't just my experience of the year it was it's sort of a document of like here's what happened this year here's how we all felt about it and those 11 songs kind of reflect that Amazing. Cool. Fun. I dig it. Yeah. Um, going back to the, your TEDx talk now, um, just actually more like we're there in your journey. Any other uh, milestones that you can think of after the TEDx talk until now? You know, we, the TEDx talk after that, we, we really kind of, in the, in the couple of years after that, that's when our house concert touring really became really turned sort of like it became it in its fullest bloom. I would, I would want to say in the years after that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and we really just focused on that. There wasn't any like major shift or change. And honestly, when the pandemic hit, that was the, the next sort of like moment, <laughs> you know, yeah, like the next moment yeah. where things kind of like had to shift. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't anything that we sought after obviously, but like it was there. And so it was an opportunity to, to, look at some things differently and, and think about how I wanted to reemerge from this time. Now, do you plan on going back to house tours at any point or are you just, um, I mean, I know you're focused on this new theater tour, which is a big endeavor. Sounds amazing. Um, do you have any plans of going back to, to you? Cause you know that you have some success in that. I think that both Jamie and I, as we've talked about it and thought about it, um, we love the experience of, doing those kinds of intimate shows. And yes, we would like for that to be part of our future in some way, but I don't think we'll go back to them the way that we were doing them before. Like we might, like if, if we were like, we had been doing these shows in people's you know homes and pushing all the limits and trying to bring these wow experiences. 
And now we're kind of taking the wow experience into the theaters. And I'm wondering if when we do any, if and when we do house concerts again, if we go sort of the opposite direction and go even more stripped down, even more intimate, even mm. more, like I could see us going out with like our vintage Wurlitzer and Jamie, Jamie accompanying me and we're like no PA and we're in people's living rooms, like really mm. stripped back. Yeah, yeah, You know, like I could see us really enjoying that um, and kind of like taking our sort of creative uh, inspirations into sort of a bifurcated thing where we're doing the big stuff in the theaters and we're doing the real connective human stuff in a much For more sure. intimate way. Yeah. For sure. Well, yeah, that would be cool. That would feel really intimate. And it's, it's interesting how you have um, really learned from each step. It sounds like you're really paying attention to what's working, what's not but you're still not afraid to switch it up even when you know something's working. Is... You say I'm not afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid all the time. Okay, we're all afraid. Okay, <laughs> the reality is everyone's afraid of everything. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it is. It, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm totally, like I wake up on a daily basis and think to myself, okay, don't let those thoughts take over the day. Let's, you know, because like, we're trying something new. It is inevitably scary. It is inevitably, it's, I mean, there is no, there is no safe risk, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right. yeah. it doesn't no. exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like, yeah, if, if, but when you're compelled to try something new, when you feel like in your heart of hearts, like this is something I've got to do. Well, then you just got to take over. You got to do that. You got to figure out how to take, how to make the steps to do that. You know, um, we, we had this, Jamie and I had this whiteboarding session at the beginning of January of this year, 2023. And we had just put out good to me and it was getting really lovely reviews from people who were hearing it new it was getting into new ears. It was really exciting to see, you know, the response that this album was getting. Um, and a cool validation of like the extra time and effort that went into creating it because of having all this extra time during the pandemic to like really make something that we were super proud of, you know? But we were like, okay, now what? Like, we really want more people to hear this. We're really proud of this album. We're really proud of this work. Like what, you know, and, and we've been sort of dabbling with the ideas of like what we wanted our touring and performance life to look like, you know, when, we, when it was safe to go out in the world again and do that on a, on a larger scale. And so we, we broke down, we get this big, you know, white easel with the colored pens, the smelly kind, of course. And, um, <laughs> and you know, wrote down just big picture where, you know, if, 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 if there were no limits on what we could do, what would, where would we want to be performing? How would we want to be doing this? And we wrote down, we want to perform in theaters. We want to do it. We want to put together a show that is this music and narrative storytelling with score, kind of a theater show, you know. Um, that would be sort of like a, a mix between like a Pet Shop Boys concert and a TED Talk, you know, like that sort yeah. of like, you know, uh, marriage of an experience. And so we're like, we want to play in theaters. And we're like, we have no idea how to do that. <laughs> we just, we've been playing in people's backyards for 10 years. How do we do that? You know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, through a series of events, like we, we, we had to break it down into smaller chunks. Okay, well, okay, well, Maybe we need to be able to tell people the story of what a theater show would look like. So maybe we need to stage a show somewhere that looks like a theater show captured on film and like use that to tell the story of what we're after, you know, and maybe we could, you know, see what we can get from there. So we called up a, a, a friend in Sacramento who's started a concert promotion company years back and was just to ask him for suggestions of venues that we might do this in and he's like well how about we put you in the sophia theater instead so we're like oh really no i don't think we can do that but he thought we could so we did it and we did our first theater show in april way sooner than we ever thought we would do that you know but it was just as, as it was the result of of breaking it down into little bite-sized chunks like here's what we can do let's chase this down and then from there chase the next thing down and you know it it, it happened a lot quicker than we thought but then we've been using that experience to build out this, these next theater shows that we're doing. We're doing four in the month of September um, in various parts of the country. And it, this is just the next little part we're chasing down that we hope will be a building block toward what we see, you know, for the future of this show in theaters. 
Yeah, well, and reaching out, reaching out to your network to uh, fill in any gaps, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's it's a massive uh, lift to get butts and seats to these shows. You know, yeah. like we've never dealt with having to sell tickets before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How are you trying to get butts and seats? Oh my God, we're just pushing it on every level that we possibly can. You know, we're we're. I mean. Frankly, one of the things, and, and this kind of harkens back to our conversation about like um, the, the the tension that artists face of like putting on this front of I'm an artist versus being authentically themselves, you know, like there's part of me that's like, I just want to tell people we're playing at the theater and that like, it's just, look at this, look at this wonderful thing we're doing. <laughs> but what I'm really needing to do is tell people like, look, in order to play these shows, we're actually four walling some of these rooms ourselves and taking a massive financial risk. Like I'm showing people we're taking a huge financial risk to put these shows on. We really need your help <laughs> to like not lose our shirts, mm -hmm. you know? So like mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, where part of me would just like to gloss over and just say, look how shiny and nice all this is. I know from my experience, what I really need to be doing is showing people the nitty gritty of what this, what, what all this involves and asking them, to be part of it. That's mm -hmm. over and over and over and over and over again. That has been the, the, the lesson of my career in music is just asking people who, who say they support what we do to actually support it and be part of it. And mm -hmm. it's a meaningful experience for us to be part of things. You know, this is why I volunteered in Wisconsin for the election. I wanted to be part of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, like, right, we yeah, want yeah. to be part of things that are bigger than us that mean something to us, you mm -hmm. know? And that's been a lesson over and over and over. So we're just literally just asking folks to show up for us. Now, did you strategically pick venues in places? Maybe you did house concerts before, you know, you have sort of a, a bit of a following there. Mostly. Um, yes, mostly that is true. Um, we picked venues in it's, so we've got four shows coming up next month. Three of them are in places where we have a concentration of people that we believed would, would help us, you know, put enough butts in seats to make the show great. Uh, one of those places, one of the places we're going is not. One of those places is a place we've, I think maybe I cruised through and played a coffee house there once back in my college touring days, but literally I've like really never played uh, in Omaha before. Like this is a brand new city for me. The reason we're doing it, a couple of reasons is that uh, we have a friend who has been a supporter of our music for a long time. She hosted a house concert when she lived in um, Northern Virginia a number of years ago. She lives in Florida now. She flew out to Sacramento to see our first theater show in April. Like she's a true believer. She had some business there too, so she was able to combine the trip. But anyway, she, she made an effort to get out there for our show, sure. which was so awesome. And at the end of that show, she was like, you need to do this show in Omaha. She lived there recently. Uh, also like ran for city council. So she's very well connected in the, in the community. And she's like, there's a perfect theater. I will help you get people there. And we're like, interesting. It would be an interesting experiment to play in a theater where we don't have an existing community because eventually that's one of the things we want to be doing. We want to be going into new communities where we don't have an established following. So maybe we'll take her up on helping us do this show here as sort of a test to see if we can pull off going into a theater, into a community where we don't have an existing audience. So we'll see how it goes. Like it's still a mystery. We don't, we won't know until next mm -hmm. month. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Exciting, exciting and scary, but yes. super cool. Um, now before, before um, I let you go, I did want to ask also about um, social media because that's obviously a pretty big thing with independent musicians these days. Mm. Um, Jamie was mentioning you guys getting onto Mastodon social. Oh, yeah. I'm curious about that because a lot of us haven't either heard of it or oh. um, definitely haven't taken the dive to, to um, add that to the plethora of, of platforms that we are trying to keep track of. So what's yeah. your experience with that? I love Mastodon. <laughs> <laughs> and I should say Mastodon is, is how I participate in what is called the Fediverse, which is larger than Mastodon. The Fediverse mm -hmm. is, uh, it's a federated group of people of users who can talk to each other via, um, 
is it the activity pub platform is what it's called. And I'm not a tech person, so don't ask me any more about that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's essentially a protocol that allows uh, various uh, users to connect with each other. Kind of the way that I was described to you that makes sense to me is that like um, via email, we can all talk to each other. Our email addresses can each talk to each other, even though you might be on Gmail and I might be on my own server or someone else might be on Yahoo or whatever. Like they're on their own servers, but because of the email protocol, the way it's written, we can all talk to each other. Cool. The Fediverse is similar, but think of it. It's, it's like a, it's a, a, a social network where lots of different servers. So it's not like the Facebook server or meta, sure. right? It's not Twitter server or X, whatever. Yeah. Whatever he's doing with, <laughs> with that company, but you know, like it's not like a private entity server that's hosting all this stuff, right? It's all these private entities, lot it's decentralized. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we can all talk to each other via this protocol. Yeah. So my experience on Mastodon or on the Fediverse looks and feels a whole lot like Twitter or Facebook or Instagram in a lot of ways. I have a feed of people that I follow. I can boost their, their posts. I can direct message them. I can reply. I can, you know, do all the things that we, we are used to doing on other social platforms. Um, but it's completely non-commercial. There's nobody harvesting your data. There's nobody... Uh, selling you ads. There are no ads. It's just, it's just people. It's like the internet was always supposed to be. You know? like, <laughs> it's just people connecting with other people. You can, you can uh, search on hashtags and follow hashtags. So you like areas of interest and all that kind of stuff. Like it's, it's a robust uh, worldwide group of people talking about stuff that matters to them on all different topics. Right. Uh, the beauty of it being decentralized is that like if there are bad actors, you can just, if the person running your server decides here are the criteria, you know, like, like we don't want fascists on our server. They, if someone tries to po post that shit, they get blocked. Like, they, so, you ah. don't, so you're not having to deal with so much of the crap that we've all had to deal with, with corporate social media. And, and actually mm -hmm. the difference is, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I, I have not been on TikTok and I understand that's a, been a big thing for musicians. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. And so I never have, but like all of these entities are private that like they're, they're corporations and it, it is social media. What mm -hmm. the Fediverse is, is social networking. And it, it feels entirely different. So in terms of my experience there, um, in sharing my music and sharing what we're up to artistically or just in our lives. Like I've had more robust like connections and communications with real humans about over music in Mastodon since I joined last November. I've had more, more there than I feel like I ever have had like in, in terms of like meaningful daily interactions with people over music. Like it's wow. my favorite place to be online when I go online these days. Incredible. It's really incredible. And, and because it's not a corporate thing with a, you know, shiny sign up page where you just type in your data and go, and then they own you forever. Um, it's a little bit, uh, it can feel a little bit more tricky to get yourself set up in there, but it's worth it. Like there's just rich interactions. I have I've made friends via, you know, real, like people I, I can't wait to meet in real life, you know, like that I've, mm -hmm. that I've gotten to have conversations with on Mastodon oh, because of music and the connections we're talking, we're, you know, we're just chatting about, about stuff. Um, it's, it's wonderful. And like oh, cool. tons more, like I, I, they're huge into folks who, who are in the Fediverse are really um, supportive of like the band camp type, you know, uh, um, experience um and so like my band camp sales have you know have gone up it's not like they're significant but like a lot more people engaging on that platform which is really cool um it's just it's neat it feels genuine and human and real and i can't recommend it enough yeah it sounds a lot more supportive yes in real real reality i should say like people can say they're supporting you on instagram or whatever but um it sounds like there's actual people are taking some action over there yeah and you know what these days, I'll, 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 I cross post everywhere, 
I do. Like I, the stuff mm -hmm. I'm posting on Mastodon, I'm posting the same stuff on Facebook. Do you have a tool that does it? No, I don't. Okay. Because there are some times where like, um, I know that I need to change language a little bit sure. to fit different mm -hmm. platforms or whatever. But like I'll largely, for, lar for the most part, cross post. And like, within like the last week, for instance, we're posting a lot about this tour and posting a lot about our next 80s kids song that's coming out. And I'll post the same thing on Facebook and on Mastodon. And I have way more friends on Facebook than I do have followers on Mastodon. It's growing all the time. I make new connections every day, but it's still smaller than my Facebook. And I'll post something that I think is really nifty, like a cool photo or like a neat story or whatever on Facebook. And it's crickets, right? Like crickets over there. And on Mastodon, I've got a whole bunch of boosts and people replying and asking questions and new followers and da, 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 like there's all this activity wow. happening on the same post. Like people are, people are genuinely connected. And also Facebook has figured out for folks like us that they can, uh, they can get dollars out of us <laughs> if we want more interactions on our posts there by boosting thing. You know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. They'll I, throttle you. Yes. So that you have to pay them. And I won't do it. I won't do it. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I definitely see evidence of like my posts being throttled on Facebook. Yeah. And it's just so infuriating. Like we're just trying to put our creations out into the world, man. <laughs> well, and that's again why it's so important that you built an email list because yes, your email is going to get to everybody. I mean, you know, Google, Gmail will put it into like maybe a updates folder or whatever. Yeah. Or maybe it goes in their primary, but um, but they're not gonna, you know, Facebook's reach if you have a large following is like four percent of it. Like you, you worked all this time to build a big following, and then, but when you post, only four percent of them see it. Yeah, not it's cool. infuriating. Well, and it just yeah. feels it feels wrong. It feels wrong to give away my power like that. You know, like I'm still yeah. I'm still using Facebook. I'm still using Instagram. I quit Twitter last fall because I couldn't take it. Um, but like, I, I, I'm still using those, those platforms because I do have connections there that do mean something to me, you know, but I don't feel like I have power over that situation at all. You know what I mean? And like, I am just so much more about like putting my energy into, into areas of my life and my career where I know I can actually affect change, you know, mm -hmm. like that makes a whole lot more sense to me. And I feel like I'm just at somebody, at, at, I'm at this corporation's mercy. That's a terrible feeling, you know? Yeah, that's not a good feeling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, no promises, but um, I'm going to ask one more question. Okay. Uh, maybe another one, but <laughs> I'll try to make it my last one. Your tour, your show, it's just you and Jamie on stage, right? Yeah. So how are you guys doing that? Because I'm curious for my own music, because I make it all in my own studio and I layer yeah. stuff and I'm just doing it by myself. And I'm thinking about like, oh, I could get a band together or I could loop or I could have backing tracks. Do you guys use backing tracks? Is Jamie doing a lot of that on the fly? I know he's a synth wizard. How are you guys, what, what's the setup look like? It's a combo of those things that you just okay. described. So um, when, we, when we did the house concert stuff, it was just me up front on stage, <laughs> you know, performing. And he was running sound from the audience from like an old iPad. And sometimes he would cue off like little sound cues to go with my story as well. So he was always involved in the performance, but in a very like behind the scenes kind of way. For this show, I didn't want to be behind a keyboard anymore. I wanted to be able to roam free. So I got myself a wireless microphone, like a pop star and like I'm out there, you know, with, a, with just me and a mic. And, but that doesn't seem all on its own. That didn't seem all on its own to feel like enough energy on stage. So we decided like, okay, let's, let's bring Jamie on stage and he'll be running the music from stage. So he is playing live synthesizer along with some backing tracks. He's also singing backup vocals. So there's a, there's kinetic energy on stage. There's enough happening on stage that using the tracks is believable. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's, um, it's more believable is not the right word. It feels appropriate. You know, if it were just me as a singer and there's nothing else on the stage and there's all this music happening, that feels a little karaoke. -ish. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, maybe karaoke. Yeah. yeah. But just with having him in his little station with his synthesizer, his controller keyboard, his rack, 
you know, and all that kind of stuff, it makes the whole thing like, oh yeah, this is a show, you know? And I love seeing an instrument too, you know, versus just, just music coming from nowhere. Yeah. But the really, one yeah. of the really cool thing too, things too, is that, um, so he's running all of this and it was a massive project for him to build out. He's using Ableton live to okay. cue all of the tracks. Um, so the, the tracks are being cued. Um, also what's being, whenever he selects that song, whatever, it also sets up his controller keyboard to the right sound setting. So like, he doesn't have to do that live. Like it, it just happens. Like it, they, they talk to each other. And so his, he's got the right sound for that song, you know, whenever he cues each song. Right. But we mm -hmm. also have a whole visual element element for this show too. We worked with a brilliant uh, musician and uh, computer programmery guy um, from Nashville. His name is Charles Kasky, who uh, makes gorgeous uh, ambient, mu ambient pedal steel music. It's Ooh. so, so beautiful. Jamie mixed a project, a project of his a couple of years ago, and it's just one of my favorite music. instruments, pedal okay. steel. So emotional. That well, instrument. check out Charles Kasky's music. You will okay. fall in love. Right. Um, but he's also he, like his day job is he's a professor at Vanderbilt in computer science. And so he has also been experimenting over the last, last year or so with developing uh, generative video that's that so taking cues from music that create visuals right so like he's working on that and we saw some of his experiments with that on instagram last year we're like oh maybe he would build some things for us so he did he built a, a generative video for every song in our set um for this theater show and they're just these wow. gorgeous expansive responsive video elements unique to each song in the set and so those are also being cued by the ableton live so like it's just a really streamlined setup where wow. you know jamie hits play and we're off to the races the track's running his synthesis programmed correctly the video has started you know and and, it, and that's that's wow. how the show runs. it's pretty so cool. cool are yeah. you guys filming the that at all we did we filmed it in April. We had a, um, that was one of our main uh, goals for that first show was to capture it on film. So a filmmaker friend of ours, we hired him to come and do a five camera shoot for us. So we do have footage um, and we've actually only just been able to start piecing that together to do trailers for um, oh, cool. hopefully selling the show for, you know, future. But no runs. plans to film these future shows? Uh, no, no, not, not. See, I'm I mean, just trying I, to get, I'm just trying to get in on it. So I can't attend. I want to see. <laughs> but it sounds like you have some footage. Um, awesome. Well, it's been such a pleasure to to have you. You and Jamie are beautiful people. I love you guys. Aww. Um, anything else you want to like part with to tell people? Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, I don't really have any. I don't think there's anything that's on my mind. It's been so great to talk with you. Like I, I love the opportunity to talk with another human who's trying to figure out their way downhill, like water down a mountain, you know, like yeah, doing it in yeah. the most authentic and loving way possible. It's, it's great. Yeah. And I, I really think that there was a lot of really good nuggets that a lot of independent musicians could really learn from, from this talk. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, people will listen and gain a lot from it. And um, again, thank you so much and I'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Jack. It's been so fun. Right on. See you, Shannon. <laughs>